started. Uh, the next uh, panel today is on uh, patent identification. Thank you. And before I jump into any of the substance, I'd like to give uh, all the panelists a chance to quickly, very quickly, uh, introduce themselves and, and, and kind of say what they're doing right now, how that, uh, and what their background is. And uh, I'll start with you. Hi, I'm Eve Saltman. I'm the General Counsel at Online. We're located in Mountain View. We have two e-commerce services we provide using our technology platform. One is the online game service, which allows you to play video games in the cloud. And the other is the online desktop, which is a mobile productivity app. Hi, my name is Sasha Rao. I'm a partner in Game and Caption based in Palo Alto. I specialize in patent litigation. And before joining Bring and very recently, I was a partner at Ropes and Gray, also specialized in the patent litigation. I'm Barbara, and uh, I'm a black litigation partner at in Watkins. Um, so, like Sasha, um, and prior to joining Latham, I was uh, 41 years ago as a Ken Korea, Vice President and Head of the uh, U.S. Life Center in Silicon Valley for Samsung Electronics. Uh, I was a patent litigator in um, private practice, and I also had a fair amount of IT transactions. I'm Rich Gray, General Counsel of Spire Communications PLC, a London public traded company. I am based in Silicon Valley, however, and I am involved in this globally for all things. So, anything that has to do with anything. Hi everybody, I'm Andrew Clungness. I'm a partner with uh, Brian Cave. I am uh, located in San Monica, California, which uh, for those of you who don't know is in the Los Angeles area. Uh, I am a transactional lawyer. My practice focuses on uh, strategic alliances, tech and IP transactions. Uh, I represent clients in a uh, fairly broad range of industries, <coughs> ranging from you know, hard, hardware, software, traditional sort of Silicon Valley type companies, whether or not they're located here, to e-commerce and uh, interactive entertainment, sort of more maybe Los Angeles' uh, take on tech to more traditional industries such as uh, retail and uh, manufacturing. Great. And I'm Jim Carano. I'm a partner of Wilmer Hale, uh, formerly a partner at uh, Wilson Samsung, focused on uh, transactions generally for tech companies, but in particular transactions that are driven by uh, more the property Lately, a lot of uh, communication systems uh, that are uh, hitting the press lately. So, uh, just kind of jumping into the substance here, you know, I suspect it will surprise no one that, uh, according to pretty much every available metric we have, uh, the valuation of patents as a commercial asset uh, has never been higher and by significant margins over the last decade. Um, this is certainly due in part to the rise and increased prevalence of non-practicing entities, which are uh, companies that focus primarily <coughs> on acquiring, licensing, and enforcing patents. And you know, even beyond that, the uh, kind of the increased public attention that, that's been given to uh, high-profile patent lawsuits like Apple, Samsung, and, and billion-dollar-plus uh, settlements that are going on has certainly helped uh, kind of focus attention uh, among deal lawyers and uh, business people on the risks of patent infringement and the value of patents generally. And so against that backdrop, I guess it's no surprise that uh, patent limitation has become a hotter topic and that it's, it's become an issue that, that seems to be discussed at much more length in the context of uh, uh, transactions of various sorts that, that I think uh, is true that they uh, yeah. Anything you want to talk about? Sure. Um, I, in, uh, I guess recently, as particularly as the uh, person who uh, probably has one foot inside and one foot outside the uh, sort of pure technology space, I've really seen an entity, a, a huge uptick in entities that you might not think have a uh, substantial focus on patents in particular, regarded as the sort of headline news issue in all transactions. Um, I mean, very recently. I was involved in a joint venture where I was representing a company bringing some uh, said the technology to the table um, involving distribution of content in a novel way and uh, for, well, what was perceived as a novel way but, but um, was explained to my client as being really putting one foot in front of the other but we were bringing it to the table in a joint venture with two major entities in the entertainment 
entertainment space and a uh, global advertising conglomerate. And, and you know, of course, entertainment entities are fairly IP savvy, though not necessarily the first kinds of companies you think of when you talk about patent savvy. And as well, you know, the advertising agencies are, are you know sort of in a similar boat where they're IP savvy but not necessarily patent focused. Uh, you know, comes to mind when you think of them. And it was just very interesting in the in the transaction where. You know, most of the commercial activity was going to happen in the EU. What my client was bringing to the table was software. I mean, the, many, I'm sure many of them on the panel knows, and, and most folks in the audience know, in the EU, software patents are certainly not what they are in the United States, and the litigation life there is certainly not what it is as well over here. Nonetheless, it was the uh, five star issue, it was their number one concern in negotiations, and you know, acknowledge that claims and so forth were unlikely, and this sort of fear in their mind that uh, you know some sort of patent suit was going to sink the whole venture, um, we were able to you know, make gives in the patent area to uh, obtain favorable commercial terms, you know, favorable warranties vis-a-vis -vis things like, say, the product working and you know other commercial concessions. Um, so I, I guess the long story short is a lot of the uh, concerns about patents are very well founded, but at the same time, you know, often uh, taking a very close look at the uh, space in which you're in, taking a close look at what patents are actually out there, the, 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 the global deal, the uh, laws of the particular country, you can take this sort of press momentum and maybe uh, use it uh, in your favor. So, just, so, yeah. That, that's actually a very good perspective. I mean, one of the things I have to do as GC in a relatively small company, we only sell about 500 a year globally, our customers are Telecoms, as everybody from Cisco, Huawei, to PT, and Verizon, and Mobile, um, I have to pick my fights. And one of the ways that I make the decision as to which fights to pick is to step back and do a risk analysis. So, again, we do a lot of business in the EU, so for a software related issue, I'd be less concerned about a patent indemnity. But from, from my perspective, the reason why I'm able to sleep at night is we don't sell components in the telecom. We don't sell software in the telecom industry if they don't make part of their products. We sell test hardware and software so that everyone from the OEMs to the telco operators can determine whether the various components from smartphones right up to the, the heavy metal that the system and Huawei sell will actually perform as expected when subjected to real traffic, the emulate traffic. So as a, somebody that litigated for 17 years before I came into the PC world about 14 years, I step back and say, okay, is this a fight I really have to fight? Am I really going to be put in a position where this indemnity is ever going to be called on? These you know, very fine technical folks will give you the ins and outs of which clauses you, you, know, you, you want to try not to get clogged on and all the rest of that. But a 500 million a year company negotiating with Cisco and AT&T, I don't have a lot of leverage. So one of the things I look at, and Samsung, you know. <laughs> So again, I look, I look at the fights that I have to fight and point about, well, maybe this is something I don't have to be striving about, but there's something else in the contract that I care more about. That's, you know, that's sort of the best practice for me. Don't fight about something that probably isn't going to happen. Yeah, so he thinks that I only do deals where we have all the leverage, but unfortunately, you know, <laughs> <laughs> those deals where our guys have the uh, leverage, they don't, they don't, our business guys will handle themselves. They don't need more leverage. They can get or leave it. The ones where we are the supplier, those ones, <laughs> when we have no leverage, they come to me. <laughs> so, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, I was negotiating a patent uh, in the nation as recently as uh, midnight last night. So, <laughs> as a supplier, <laughs> where we don't have much leverage. So, I uh, hear you. And uh, I, it was kind of interesting because I was talking with a colleague of mine that you know, patent indemnity should not be what, what breaks the deal. You know, it, it, it's like a tail wagging the dog. And then you know, in the afternoon I get this email saying, uh, can we work out all the business issues? Uh, what's holding up the deal is the patent indemnifications. You guys want to bless this or not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> what is this? What is this? And you know, I think what it is is that because of all what's happening in the uh, uh, mobile world, you know, a lot of business people are concerned about you know, 
of patent issues, and they really don't want to take the risk. And if they can shift risk to the other side, you know, they, that's what they want to do. But you know, the, uh, at the end of the day, I think the core for ninth, I think the uh, core has prevailed, and the other side decided to be a lot more reasonable. So I think we were able to resolve that issue. But you know, we can all talk about all these things, but uh, at the end of the day, I mean, it's really a business issue. We can identify what the risk is, and to the extent possible, we can try to assess what that risk is in terms of real dollars, but at the end of the day, if we really want to do the deal or not, indemnity is something, is something that's going to happen in the future, and if uh, that deal doesn't make sense uh, as a business proposition, we shouldn't do it. If it really makes the deal make sense, but uh, have the indemnity, then really have to make a decision and at that point it no longer becomes a legal issue, it becomes a business issue. Of course, business guys don't want to hear that. <laughs> well, an, an important point out for something Ken said is, I, I said I don't have a lot of leverage, so I'm trying to find some when I need it. And I've actually come up with this crazy concept, it's called fairness. So what I try to do is, is when I'm dealing, well, stay with me for 35 foot seconds. What I try to do is look to what the company I'm negotiating with does when they're on the other side of the table. So if, I, if they're asking to, for me to identify them against the sun coming up in the morning um, and the moon becoming a full moon every 28 days or so, what I try to do is to find out through various you know, circles, which I'm not going to reveal now, um, what do they get? And they're the ones giving the indemnity, and then I try to bring that back and say, well, wait a minute, you're asking me for this over here, which is way overreaching. That has definitely started. This is what you give. How do you reconcile those two? It actually works sometimes, not all. You probably know which company it doesn't work. Can you, can you speak to how this might be a little, uh, you know, how this might be different dealing with the software and content world, and, and in particular, you sound like you're both in the consumer space and in the enterprise space. And you get to see a lot of uh, different risk allocations because of that. Uh, that we definitely do. I mean, we not only license content from video game publishers, we're also licensing out our app to device makers. So we are definitely on both sides of the issue. Unfortunately, everyone wants complete, uncapped IP infringement indemnities, no matter where we are. So we definitely have to deal with. We're a small company. We want to get these deals done. We don't have a lot of leverage. And so, you know, I'm, I'm in Rich and Ken's camp. I mean, I think I try to look at what's reasonable for us to take on as a risk and what, you know, given that we're so small, what is it that we can take on? And then try to put a box around that. And then, you know, at the end of the day, the business people want to get the deal done. So really, what's, what's the best deal I can get done given all of these things being stacked against us. And I try to, in each situation, figure out what is the other party really concerned about? And can I carve things out of what we're indemnifying for that they might not care about? Um, for example, in a content deal, we're licensing content for a really large company. And we spent, I think, three months alone just on the indemnity. Just, and they, their view was, we're a really big content company. When we do deals with, with you know, people like you, we get complete uncapped indemnity, and we're really concerned about patents because you're like in a new space, and you're a new provider of this service, and so we have no idea what's out there, and so you know, we, just, we just want it all. And so after a while, we were able to, I was able to help them understand, look, we've got a service, but the service is composed of a lot of different things. We've got third-party content, we've got hardware and software in the data center, we've got third-party networking. I mean, you, we can't possibly, we don't have indemnities from all of our various suppliers, and so we can't possibly pass that on to you. So figuring out what you can carve out and what little nugget is going to satisfy the other side, I think is really a key to this. Great. Well, to keep this thing moving, I, we thought it might be useful to uh, to pose a few kind of hypotheticals as a way to kind of, uh, rather than any of us talking in detail about particular uh, aspects of our, our own businesses, we might have some hypothetical examples that might uh, spark discussion here. So the first hypothetical we're talking about here is uh, uh, two companies, Chipco and PhoneCo. Chipco is selling uh, Wi-Fi chips uh, 
uh, an associated software for smartphones and phone colors uh, selling smartphones that they need Wi-Fi chips to go into and they're trying to negotiate an indemnity. Uh, Ken, what, as a, on behalf of Funko, if you were representing Funko in this, in this situation, what would be the things you would be most concerned about? Would you care about caps on, on liability? Would you, would you care about combinations? What, what, would, what would really be the kind of things that, that, that as phone call you would be worried about and, and most focused on? Infringement. 
and certainly, certainly the case that Akamai, you know, is, is kind of drawing the boundaries slightly differently, and changing, the, changing what the gray areas are as far as that goes. But it certainly is an interesting um, way to formulate the the, the the four corners on the indemnity based on the direct and indirect infringement, rather than you know intended use of the product or material, whether it's all the material elements are covered by the product. So that certainly Akamai may encourage. Indemnities to be written to talk about direct and indirect infringement rather than some of the other formulations that, that uh, might be more common. But going back to your question, uh, I don't think anybody's going to amend their indemnity provision in light of uh, the case of that society. So, Bumco is not going to want to expand to have indirect infringement? Well, you know, business people don't think of Their world is much bigger than the patent issue, so they just not going to agree to it. Although, I will say, Bumco. If, if, if I know phone code, they probably already got uh, pretty wide and <laughs> yeah. if, I, if I had to guess what the leverage is in that deal. Alright, and ship code, you're, are you going to agree to it or you're not going to agree to it? Like, seriously. But it comes back to you want to close the deal. If you're the one selling and they've got an alternative source, this, I, I will go to a CEO, my CEO, usually on something about, like, say, transfer of IP ownership and say, look, we just have to say no on this one even if we lose the deal. In the 31 years I've been practicing, I've never gone to anyone or I've ever seen anyone go to anyone and say, hey, we just can't do this $10 million order because they're asking for an overreaching patent indemnity clause. It's just not going to happen. I think, though, that there is a way to address it. It's a practical matter if you, and I haven't actually sat down and tried to write this because Usually, the job of transaction lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> but conceptually, I'm not sure. If it, I, I think a pro properly drafted indemnity clause that specifically covers induced infringement, you know, will will not really extend the scope of exposure for for Chipko in this particular instance. But if, if you basically limit it, for instance, to you know, if, if the inducement is caused simply by selling the product in the way that it's intended to be, to be used. Way it's intended to be sold. If you can somehow craft an indemnity provision that says just that, you can in fact cover the narrow type of inducement for the well, not necessarily narrow, but the, the, the specific type of inducement that Akamai, the Akamai situation encompasses without as a practical matter really extending the scope of your exposure for selling the product. You know, that, you know, for instance, in, this, in the situation of um, uh, where you have no substantial amount of inducement. As a practical matter, it's going to be very you know, We can get into the, the, a nice, interesting legal discussion, which you're Professor Wendell would be happy to jump in on this, as to whether there's really conceptually a difference in Akamai between contributory infringement and inducement. We'll put that aside. But I think as a, it, the way the issue tees up, for me at least, I think that you could draft a, 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 a clause to cover the Akamai situation without, as a practical matter, really extending the scope of the exposure. I think one, one thing I should mention is something I hesitate to bring up in a, in a context like this because maybe negotiating obligations, some of you in the future, but one of the things <laughs> as a best practice, you know, I will say that there are a lot of there are a lot of indemnity clauses that use the term uh, that talk about um, infringement, uh, direct and indirect infringement. And I will say that uh, the reality is that indirect infringement, both contributory and inducement, require some knowledge at least knowledge elements, and in some cases, intent elements, in order for there to be for there to be that sort of infringement. And the reality is, in the real world, that knowledge and intent almost never exist in the context of some future infringement, um, future hypothetical infringement that, that, that might uh, lead to an indemnity. In other words, the situation is, uh, customer gets sued, customer has an indemnity that says, uh, if, if my sale of my product directly or indirectly Infringes, infringes this patent claim, then I'm liable to for, for the indemnity. But in order for me to indirectly infringe that patent, I almost certainly have to know about the patent. And in the case of inducement, I might, there might be a, a further intent element that I actually intended my sale or my actions to cause that infringement to happen. 
And that's a, it's a pretty rare case to be able to prove all of that in the context of an indemnity situation. And so, in reality, these indemnity clauses, as currently drafted, may not be as broad as some people are leading to be. And so, what this means, and from a best practice perspective, is if you're going to be using contributory induced infringement or indirect infringement more generally in these indemnity clauses, you probably need to read out those. You probably need to say in your indemnity clause, excluding any knowledge or intent requirements required there for something like that. You need to somehow carve back into uh, indirect infringement to actually mean, you know, that it's, you know, the, 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 the objective elements of it keep excluding the knowledge and intent requirements. But I think that's probably the best practice if you are, certainly if you're the one uh, uh, receiving that indemnity to make sure that the indirect part of that indemnity actually has meaning. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm representing phone code in this situation, I would basically say, I would push back and say, that's fine, except that the, 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 the intent, intent is included within the scope of the indemnity if it's simply inferred from the fact of selling the product. Because in the Akamai situation, that's where I think things are driven. It's an inferred intent simply from the act of selling the product. And that should be covered theoretically Before we leave this, I'm sorry, I have a question. I have two questions. Um, for the litigators, how do you actually work those indemnities out when you are litigating? Is, is, it, is it always clear contractually what you have to do, or does it end up being a settlement mm -hmm. of something based on the contract that was written? I'll tell you my second question too, but it's slightly separate. How do you deal with condemnation? Uh, like, do you do a portion and responsibility and combination type things, and how do you do that? Right, so uh, dealing with them together, uh, dealing with the first question primarily, it, it is a negotiation in the commercial context because it's not like somebody, want a company which has been sued for infringement and tenders the indemnification claim to the supplier. Uh, the supplier is not going to be inclined to uh, just say, go pound salt. They're going to want to negotiate. And so then it becomes how much leverage each party has, and it becomes a business discussion. But you know, to answer your specific question, some of the factors that may enter into is what is exactly the crux of what is accused of infringement? Is it just the chip that's applied, or is the crux of the infringement the software that builds on it that the supplier didn't really give, and it's a third-party software? Or is it that, um, you know, if in this situation, if the buyer supplied the designs, right, the customer supplied the designs to the maker to provide the chip, then it becomes a different discussion. So there are many things that go into it, but it is a bargaining situation that's driven by the market reality. It's not something people work out ahead of time because they don't know what situation they're going to get into. And it goes back to Ken's point that really then starting the negotiation again. And yeah, I would try out two things if, it were, if I were the one that they're seeking indemnity from after a lawsuit. Number one, your indemnity is only as good as my balance sheet. So go see how much money I have, get realistic about that, and then we'll, then we'll talk some. And also, if it really does involve my technology, then you're going to want my active cooperation across all of my experts. You know, we, we may be able to find some prior art that you would never find, things like that. So we really want a contentious relationship here. Well, we want to work things out in a realistic, business-like fashion so that we can link the arms against the true enemy. Right. So two things you need to find out. First, are they still in business? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Second, are we buying enough from them for, for them to be motivated to actually provide indemnity? Those are very good questions to ask if you're picking up the phone. <laughs> I was involved in a couple of these very recently. Both uh, Dell got sued recently and Nintendo got sued recently. I represented one of them. but. But it turned out that multiple of their suppliers, I represented multiple suppliers in both cases, and in every case, um, the system uh, maker tendered back pretty much to everybody that could possibly be related to the claim. And so, you know, I, had, I saw the same indemnity, the same tender letter provided to several of my clients simultaneously by each of these system guys. And then it becomes, you know, multi-way negotiation, uh, likely. Likely all of the suppliers have some interest in continuing good relations with the customer. So they all have some motivation to help solve the problem. At the same time, 
you know, they may have overlapping or unclear identity, each one of them directly to the, the system and the customer. And so at the end of the day, you often have uh, joint defense groups that get formed that are you know, nominally representing the customer but are really being funded by multiple suppliers and they negotiate what uh, their individual contributions to that joint defense group might be and to some degree what at what point they're going to stop. In some cases, they have liability caps and they say, fine, so I'll, you know, I'll fund 40% up to $5 million and then I'm out. Now I'm out. Uh, or, you know, or then we'll talk again, basically. And so there'll be a, there are a lot of, and so I'm you know, negotiating this very complex multi-way defense agreements that come up only in the context of a particular litigation. It really can't be done up front in the context of negotiating indemnity, but it's something that, that is handled in the context of a live so how litigation. important is that draft then? Whatever it is your contract, like, does it, does it well, it's a starting point. It's a starting yeah. point. Yeah. It's and a starting it changes point. the length. It really sure. does change the length. It has an impact, no question. Nobody's suggesting it's meaningless, but it's not the end of the discussion. I could raise one other issue that, with respect to best practice is in getting indemnities in the context of a litigation settlement. Um, it's very common, obviously, nowadays to settle with, with non practicing entities. And as a practical matter, patents involved uh, oftentimes, if not most of the time, long, complicated uh, chains of title, um, which, to nobody's fault or intent, may, may end up not giving all the rights to the actual party that you're settling with. So rather than, than argue uh, in context of a breach of the settlement agreement or warranty, I think it's advisable to put in a specific indemnity that says that if in fact you know rights, you know, you don't have all the rights to settle with me and I get sued, you will indemnify me for all losses, costs, and expenses as a consequence of that. And that indemnity clause gives you a little bit of a, a belt of suspenders. And, 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 and to answer your point about well, how important is this? you have to realize that the indemnity clause relates to products that are being sold commercially, products or software. And patent claims are not drafted like that. They may be drafted with a combination of a memory and a display and a smartphone and an application. So the depending on what claim has been asserted by which plaintiff, it, they, it necessarily can't be worked out ahead of time because there's millions of them. Eve, I know we've been talking about uh, kind of chips and phones here, but let's suppose for a second that we're talking about a software app being, being provided to a device maker, potentially for use as part of some sort of a, a service that's being available uh, using that phone. In what way might you think that any of this uh, might be different or any of the perspectives might, might change here at all? I, mean, I, I think there's a, a common thread here, which is, you know, you've got two business parties. Every everyone wants to do a deal, and so you've got to figure out what's the right risk allocation between the parties. And so, you know, if you're starting there and trying to. And I always start with, you know, what is what is fair for us to take on. And you know, I think from a best practice perspective, one of the things that's helped us as a small company is we always have a form. So we have a form when we license and content for our service. And we have a form for when we license out our app to device makers. And you know, you have the form, you start narrow. <laughs> you start with, you know, maybe you start with caps, maybe you start with carve-outs. You, know, you start narrow because you know you're gonna ask, get asked, you're gonna get that red line back, and it's gonna, it's gonna be no, no, you're gonna give us everything. And you, you know, think about whether you can start out offering up an indemnity, because you know you have to give one. Uh, you know, can you limit it geographically? Can you say, we're just going to indemnify people for U.S. issued patents? Um, you know, we're just going to indemnify for U.S. here. We're going to indemnify and the cap's going to be, you know, X, Y, Z amount. And so I think if you, if you think about what's, what you can offer up that's limited but seems fair because you're, you might want an indemnity back, you might need an indemnity back, so you got to offer one up that seems reasonable, but a little bit narrow, knowing that you're going to get to the middle somewhere. That's probably worth mentioning. Um, there are a lot of a lot of times you see uh, liability caps that ostensibly are supposed to cover the indemnity. Um, I will say that in the real world, when these, when these liability caps actually become live, in other words, when you know someone's actually performing an indemnity, 
there is often a lot of uh, disagreement as to what the indemnity, what the cap on the indemnity really means. Are we really talking about this cap, you know, applying to every dollar that the indemnitor invests in trying to defend and settle his lawsuit, or is the cap really about only the dollars paid out by the indemnitor in, a, you know, in response to a judgment or in settlement of litigation? Or is it something in between? Is it just the attorney's fees? Or it, there's, there's always a lot of discussion about, well, it says four million, but is what, you know, what, what counts towards the four million? Is it dollar one? Is it just damages and settlements? And so, once again, best practices is probably worth, um, you know, spending some energy explaining what you really mean by the liability cap applying to the indemnity. Although I will say that. There are a lot of times where my clients will say, well, we know it's ambiguous, but we know if we bring it up, it's going to get even worse. Yeah. It's getting even worse, or it's going to, you know, it's, it's going to be a rat hole for the next, you know, six weeks. And so, you know, there are a lot of people that are going in eyes open and saying, we know this is ambiguous and we'll deal with it later. Um, but just want to point out that in the real world, this becomes yet another uh, negotiation, something that ostensibly is supposed to be nailed down by the draft ends up just becoming, becoming another launching point for, for negotiation when the indemnity actually comes on. I would actually add as a, sorry, as a corollary best practice to sort of separately consider the appropriateness of the cap for defense costs and the uh, identification for the settlement and or uh, judgment. I think as a uh, supplier speaking of situations that you create leverage or you're, you know, this indemnity is only as good as my balance sheet and slash my insurance coverage, which I think is, is, yeah, exactly, non-existent for patent claims. Um, you know, when that, that point can often carry the day or be very persuasive if you're representing a supplier or a vendor or the like, because you can say, look, and especially if you're providing a product that's essential, you know, a component that's essential to a product, the uh, customer has a lot of reasons to keep you happy, sane, stable, and so forth, because they depend on you. Um, I think, as well, defense costs, if you're representing a, a supplier or a vendor, you know, though they might not necessarily be incurred solely, you know, in defense of one customer, they might be, uh, it might be an issue where you, where you know, as a supplier and 10, 20, 100 of your customers are sued, and that those uh, defense efforts may well be, you know, applicable to, to, to some, all, or, uh, you know, in few cases, I guess, none of your customers, but that can be sort of a separately managed and tracked expense to what you would actually have to pay out of pocket Back to the uh, and, you know the resolution or something of any plan. Just two comments. One off of what's just discussed is something new. Um, sometimes ambiguity is your friend. Everybody in this room is a good lawyer. We see something, we say, "Oh my God, I got to go fix that." If you're providing the indemnity, restrain that urge. If you've got something in the indemnity clause that the other side doesn't realize is a bit vague or a bit incomplete or a bit ambiguous. Their form. It's not your job to help them. And again, I'm not talking about playing games, but resist the urge to fix stuff just because it's kind of who we are. Second, there's a clause you should also keep in mind when you're in these negotiating situations that you might not first think of as having anything to do with indemnity. The, uh, the field of use under your license. Be thoughtful about that. It obviously matters for all kinds of purposes, but it might also be your friend later on if you get into a fight about an indemnification clause and say, well, wait a minute, you're, you're talking about a use that you don't even have a license to. How could the indemnity possibly apply to that? And I guarantee you, 99% of lawyers on the other side of the deal are never going to think of that unless they're here today. And it's worth mentioning, before we jump to the question really quickly on that point, whether or not you have a, a, a scope limitation, a field limitation on your license, in some cases we're not talking about a license, we're literally talking about you know, sale of, of, a, of a hard product. But you should be thoughtful about how that product might be used. And you're, you're thinking about selling a Wi-Fi chip into a smartphone, but it turns out your customer's actually putting it into a $2,000, you know, uh, right, or, or right. And then those are talk about high-risk applications. You know, so they're putting it into life-saving equipment or, you know, mass transit items where the liabilities of, of many sorts, not just patent but many other sorts of indemnification that you may be able to look for may be very different depending on the use. So you should be thoughtful about if you either want to say this indemnity only applies to the extent that the intended use is you know, this, 
this is actually going in the phones, that, you know, even if I can't tell you under any other, any number of reasons, I can't tell you where you can and cannot use my product, I can tell you that if you do use my product in certain ways, all bets are off on this indemnity or every other sort of liability that you may want to be covering. So, I, Rich, I, I think it's a great point about field of use, although I guess I wonder whether it can go in the opposite direction. So if, if you've got ambiguity or you don't, you haven't dealt with it, right? So um, uh, aren't I, as the person being sued, uh, going to have a reasonable argument to say, well, look, you specifically called out in this license that I was going to be doing it for this purpose. Uh, uh, shouldn't that, surely you must have intended to identify me. A absolutely it can. But the field of use is what the field of use is. I'm, I'm just pointing out that there's a, is a weapon to reach for sometimes that you might not first think of in an indemnity situation. And I, you know, I, I've been in the corporate world now 14 years. It never ceases to amaze me that even good lawyers will take a 30-page contract and change three of the four relevant clauses and not see the fourth one. And I sit there and I look at it and I go, wow, if they fix the fourth one, I'd really be in a bad spot. But they've left a problem on the table for themselves, so I'm just going to say yes. Uh, and I'm just pointing to the one clause. You're, you're right, of course they're going to say that. But again, it's it's unlikely, again, if you're not here today, if you haven't thought of it yourself, it's unlikely that it's going to come up on the offensive side. It could. Yeah. But the other side will have really dropped the ball if they don't have indemnity. Yeah, if, they, if, they're the reaching for the, if they're reaching yeah. for the license clause, you're already in a break negotiation. Yeah, exactly. Two, two questions. One is, um, do you see in your negotiations with anyone who can take this, um, uh, the issue of uh, formulating the indemnity as a defend, indemnify, and hold harmless, as opposed to a defend and pay any damages ultimately yeah. awarded? And how important is that in what your experience is? Yeah. Um, and then secondly, um, I guess this might vary depending on what business line you're in, do you see um, exclusions for standard essential patents or for open source? Um, I'll take the first question. Um, which is, uh, yes, I absolutely see defend, and when I'm on the, the side giving it, I often insist on it, particularly if I'm a uh, vendor selling an end user product. You know, the idea, I, I think the difference between the, the defend and pay and, and indemnify is not uh, fully uh, always appreciated, particularly in the, where there's a carve out for consequential damages and the like. A somewhat related issue, but um, one year year, all of our drafting key cards is you'll often see indemnification not tied to third-party claims, often tied generally to, to, to any breach, and uh, you know, that's often uh, something, again, I don't think is very well understood how severe the consequences can be there, because uh, as probably everybody in this room knows, indemnification is often carved out of uh, liability limits or exclusions and damages. So, yeah. I think, you know, quickly, two things. One, on, uh, on that generally, I think I have definitely seen in the real world People make claims under a broadly written indemnity for design line expenses or, or expenses necessary to avoid the patent going forward, and those costs can be, you know, can be very large. Somewhat, you know, they're somewhat valuable, but there still can be you know, multiple millions of dollars in claims just for uh, non third party claim related stuff, but, but just related to I have to spend all this money to design around it and figure out how to, how to not be infringing this patent. Or in that can be a cost in itself and draft and put on indemnity. On the standard seven things, that's why I uh, use Wi Fi as the example for this uh, so we can have that conversation if we wanted to. I think the reality is that varies dramatically depending on the industry. There are certainly industries where the component base, where the person providing the piece that is closest to that standard is going to be on the hook. And there are other industries where it is accepted that at the kind of system or device level, you know. The individual pieces are not priced to include coverage for that, that standard, and in fact, the, the, the system entry is, is the one taking on responsibility. It's just, it, it, at the end of the day, Oh, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I, I, I'm glad you said that, because I've, I've uh, been amazed over the years, you know, having a pretty diverse client base where you know, somebody makes a technology product and the conversation is, you know, what the hell are you talking about? You make a Wi Fi product, of course you have to go get a license in, in maybe some of the old line manufacturing businesses. You, know, you have the old, uh, you know, buy versus build paradigm where, you know, what the hell am I paying you for? You know, the whole idea behind uh, hiring a manufacturer is you were going to get all the licenses and uh, sell me a finished product. It's, uh, and your point is extremely well taken for these of the uh, industries because it, it really, I almost thought I didn't know something because 
the, the responses to, to that issue have been so varied in my career. It really is. In mature industries, it's pretty clear, though, which, you know, both mature industries have decided at the end of the day which, you know, where that where that liability needs to go, and therefore, who's paying the royalties to the standards organizations, who's who's actually dealing with the standard stuff. It really is, you know, it's, it's fairly clear in the mobile space, it's fairly clear in the networking space, and the, you know, infrastructure. That, in, in every space, it, it's kind of been worked out. In new spaces, it's always interesting, you know, when you're involved in, a, in, a, in an emerging uh, product space to figure out what's going to happen with regard to standards in that space. And, and it really can deviate pretty widely as well as what makes sense in the new space. Um, if you are a seller, do you want to offer your own indemnity agreement first, sort of in terms of anchoring? And could you comment on any differences that you just raised between established versus emerging market? That's described from a long term here. Where it was the GC, well, how any lawyer, I always want to start with my form whenever I can. <laughs> um, and it, it depends where in the food chain the customer is. Some customers will say so for that. A lot of them just don't even bother to look at it, they just send their form. What do you do when that happens? I use their form. <laughs> <laughs> you, you do a nice, hefty red line. But I think um, if you do have the opportunity to use your form, I think starting with a defendant pay, um, I think that's an interesting thing to do as opposed to indemnifying hold harmless. And there's some fallbacks to defendant pay that make it seem more like indemnifying hold harmless. And um, and you can, you know, you have those as fallbacks. but. Uh, I used to work for a company, and that was our standard vendor indemnification was defend and pay. And most, I mean, most of the time it worked. And we had to add a few words, make sure that people understand. Yeah, defend through trial and appeal, and pay any final judgment. And there's a bunch of words around that. But if you can start with your own form, and you can even start with the defend and pay, right? Well. I'd love to get through, I think we spent a lot of time in the first hypothetical, but we can get through at least one more hypothetical that will talk a little more about kind of tendering and, and, and some of that might be, might get to some of the stuff we were starting from earlier about how, how tenders actually play out. So here the hypothetical is you have a pay software, the software company that sells software for mobile payments, Chipco is selling uh, communications chips that can enable, that can help enable a wireless payment system, and PhoneCo is buying both pieces. They're licensing the software, they're buying the chips, they're putting it all together, they're modifying the software to make it work with the chip in their phone, and they're putting it all together to enable wireless payments on their on their phone. Um, the the PaySoft, is, PaySoft is a small startup and it has uh, an indemnity covering direct and indirect infringement with no cap on liability. And Chipco is uh, the large public company has uh, uh, an indemnity that covers the, the, the chip as well as uh, any other hardware software necessary for the more intended use of the chip. And that has a full with our and now Funko gets sued on some sort of a patent that, that relates to mobile payments, but that requires both this sort of communications chip as well as the software, as well as uh, a general purpose method processor. And now Funko has to decide what to do with this claim that they've gotten that covers mobile payments. And obviously this, this goes back to the, the, the question that was asked earlier about what happens in the real world. Um, but you know, here, here the, is an interesting example where it's likely that one of the companies is much more relevant to this claim because it's the software is probably the mobile payments patent is probably more about mobile payment software than it is about a general purpose communications chip. But at the same time, the indemnitor there is a small startup company and query whether there's a whole lot that they can do to really help them. So in the real world, I guess you know maybe. Mike and, and Sasha can talk about kind of what, you know, what uh, Funko would likely do in that circumstance and how they would likely deal with, with the claim and this is the, the scope of the uh, coverage that, that, they, that they actually have. Okay. Um, I mean, one, again, you've got a classic problem. You know, you can't turn up on this. <laughs> no what the, what the identity is going to say. Um, but in this particular situation, um, you know, perhaps what you can do with your, your phone call is broaden the, you know, the base for the indemnity, which is to say, try to stick chip code with an indemnity that covers combination uses, such that you know, the fact that there's, their hardware is used with, their, with the software, they're still responsible for you know, indemnifying you. Um, it's tough to do in negotiation, um, but that's the only thing that I can think of in that, in that circumstance. You know, so, so I can do some other yeah. things. 
think that you know the problem here is the liability cap. Which is a big company, but you know, if you give them control, that they're not really going to care that much. And uh, you've got FaceSoft, which is uh, I wish it were in a startup because. If the magic of the uh, invention is the software, and if PaySoft were a good working company, then one strategy might be to, uh, given the current state of law and patent damages, to try to figure out if it may be better for PaySoft to be the defendant in the case, uh, or to control the case, because if their um, software is the key to the infringement claim, then if you can narrow the scope of damages at stake in the case against and, and keep your customers out of the case, you may get a strategic advantage in the case. Now that we have time to talk about uh, all the different uh, damages issues that might arise with under entire market value, under, under all the enforcement issues, but certainly that's if, if we didn't have any start, I think that's, that's a great comment, which is there's value in trying to uh, kind of recast the, the dispute of being one about uh, a small component piece rather than a large system. And with the help of what? And, yeah. and for a company like mine that isn't a startup or not a multi billion dollar behemoth either, one of the things I would look hard at if I was in an indemnity situation is do I want to bring a claim myself, a debt relief claim? Relief claim against whoever it is that is asserting the patents, so that I can control it. Right. I can drive it. And in that situation, if you did that, you could move to stay the other lawsuit. Exactly. And, and you know. Yeah. So basically, be very aggressive in a situation where your first impulse might be to curl up in a split ball, won't bring in the car, <laughs> and say, "Well, wait a minute. No, I'm going to go punch this guy in the face and try to take control of this uh, and try to drive it to a direction where I want it to go." Again, I'm, you know, I'm kind of in the middle ground. I'm not, I'm not so small that people are going to look at me and say, ah, it's not worth anything, but I'm not so big that I can take a $400 million hit either. No. I like that panel, you know, we talked earlier about um, you know, the mention of potentially limiting territory on, on an indemnity. And, and my experience is that that's become less of the hot button issue than it was a, a decade ago. Um, has the world gotten, gotten too flat to, to really have, you know, really specific geographical carve out to say I'm only giving you a US patent memory. And in the world in a world where, you know, product is being manufactured in China. It's G C I mean that's like saying you only get one bullet and you have to put it in my heart. I mean <laughs> what, what do I care about carving out outside the US? I mean I guess it makes me seem slightly better, but not at all. I mean I think I think if you are a service provider and you're providing services to another US entity and the services are only going to be provided in the US, I there's You've got some good arguments to make. Sure. Right? It's not that often, but, yeah. you know. Get what you can. But yeah. If I could exclude the U.S., that would be great. Right? <laughs> 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 Actually, just uh, surprisingly, just had that experience where I was able to do that with a U.S. company and go to another U.S. company for sales of product of phones only in China. And we got an indemnity that was well, that makes only sense. in China. Yeah. But it, it, it shocked me that we were able to, to, to get yeah. that through. Even then, you know, Worry that you know the U.S. companies, or, you know, there's certainly activities going on in the U.S. that might be relevant to that, and all those stuff. But we were able to, to really nail it down, and, and it, it, it was my, the one experience later where I was able to get you know significant geographic representation on otherwise smaller Yeah, I do think through uh, this type of carve out carefully because uh, uh, it can actually litigation costs in other country can be almost as expensive as U.S. Not think so, and that's usually the case in most countries. But there are certain countries where cost of litigation can be quite high. So watch it. It's not something you can just easily give up. If you don't have to give indemnity outside the United States, then you really shouldn't because you actually could end up being on a lot of money. But there's, there's a nuance to that for um, the method patents. So, for instance, you know, I, I think China mirrors more. You have a situation like the U.S. where you have a product made overseas infringing the U.S. patent, even though it's not that. Nevertheless, the importation is an infringement. So you could end up in a situation where you know, China would be essentially asserting um, you know, it would be a claim on a product made in the U.S. So the U.S. activities are de facto covered by Chinese law, and that's a nuance to some.
Yeah, I was going to say, we were, you know, I, I promised the panel we'd give a, we'd a lot of few minutes of questions at the end, and we haven't allowed a lot, but uh, I'd like to open up the, the floor to any questions that, that we can give up to Bruno. Have any of you ever
Jobs Act has gone into effect because the SEC needs to promulgate regulations before um, the, this crowdfunding act can become effective. And not only does the SEC have to promulgate regulations, but the SEC is requiring that FINRA, which is the old NASD, which regulates broker dealers, also has to promulgate regulations because not only do broker dealers get to become um, portals on the internet for these types of ads, but they're also allowing kind of a hybrid broker dealer to come in and create these uh, websites such as Kickstarter and Indiegogo um, that will, will promote these portals <coughs> on the internet. Um, the funding portals are a creation and a dimension of the job, and um, they are going to be not a <coughs> dealer, they will be essentially a broker dealer like, and that they won't be regulated as highly as the current broker dealers. Jeff, let's do this. Let's assume that a clever bridge is a startup. It's not a wildly successful international multi trillion dollar company. All right? Oliver's the founder of Clever Bridge. He wants to crowdfund it. Aaron, John, and Nate want to invest in Clever Bridge. Can you outline for us the players in this area, the issuer, the portal that you started to do, and also issuer, the issuer and portal and investments? Right. Well, one of the interesting things about the Jobs Act is it's created a lot of jobs. And, and the jobs that it's created are these positions which are ancillary to this new industry. And so um, one of the requirements of the um, Title Three is that, for example, Funding portals are going to have to do some due diligence on the offering that Clever Bridge is going to make. So, crowdfunding is only permitted through portals. It's yeah. created by the crowdfunding. Portal, 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 portals or broker dealers. Oh, okay. Right. Portals, broker dealers, one player, second issuer, third investor. What's the relationship in between? Okay. So, what will happen is, is that the issuer will go to the portal, they will provide them with their business plan and disclosure materials. The portal will put that information up on the internet, uh, and then the investors will come in, take a look at the deal, determine whether or not they want to invest. Uh, they will um, fill out forms which are all electronic, uh, read the disclosure. The act requires that there be educational materials, and there will also be a quiz to make sure that the investors understand what the risks are with respect to the business and the risk of illiquidity because the securities that they're going to be buying will not be tradable for a year. So, which is different than current. And so, what will happen is, is that the um, issuer will file a document through the funding portal with the SEC. 21 days have to pass before the first sale can be made. Okay. The money will come in, it will be held in escrow by an independent escrow agent. Uh, because the portals are not allowed to handle either the money or the securities. Once the deal closes, um, assuming that the target amount is hit before the deadline, then the deal is closed, the money will go to Cleverbridge, and Cleverbridge will issue through the escrow agent the securities to the investor. Are there any questions at this point about crowdfunding? How is the price set for us? How's the price well, of the street set? The, the, the question is, how is the price set? Uh, the statute says that the price is set by the issuer, but the valuation has to be disclosed on the internet, and um, people can agree or disagree with the valuation of the company. Uh, no, 30, no third party valuation is required. Um, and I think that the funding quarter will probably shy away from getting involved in any part of the valuation. So, if you're an investor uh, and you believe that the valuation is too high, then you should invest. Part of the, uh, the environment now that is, that is starting up is that they are now what are called crowdfunding capital advisors who are looking at and starting to look at deals that are being done and telling people whether or not you know, the valuations are close. And I think that that, that industry is going to get larger as this the waning two minutes of this session. Are there any other questions before I move one there? 
Um, Jeff, I guess final question would be, what kind of companies do you think will have these new capital markets? I think that um, there will be a lot of startups, but I think too that there are a lot of companies uh, around the country that are small businesses that have been locked out of getting bank loans because of the tightening of the credit market. Uh, and so perhaps your local body shop who needs a million dollar line of credit uh, may go out and uh, crowdfund for uh, debt security for a million dollars. And then um, you know, have terms which will be above market more than you can get, say, at your local bank, but less than what you get from Wells Fargo. So I think you're going to see a large differentiated class of people who are going to come in and, and use this process. We started three minutes late, or, or we started three minutes late, we're ending one minute late, so we've caught up. Thank you for joining us.